The year is 1900, and I want today to talk about the Maori Council Act and its impact upon Maori and New Zealand as a whole. Rani Natai, Maori Pomari, and Peter Buck are all names that share several things in common. One is that I am really struggling to pronounce them, and second of all, they are all alumni of Tiate College, and the third thing is that they, all their names were associated with the Maori Council Act of 1900. Under the Act, local Maori councils and marae committees were established across the country, and it was their role and responsibility to improve the health and well-being of Maori across the nation. Power was given to the council to enact a number of bylaws around the following themes. Providing for the healthy and personal convenience of the inhabitants of any Maori village. Enforcing the cleansing of houses and other buildings in dirty and unwholesome state. The suppression of common nuisances and the prevention of drunkenness and sly grog selling. It was hoped by the then Native Minister James Carroll and the fledgling Maori party that this act would lead to encouraging Māori in self-government and would raise Māori morale across the nation. The Act gave the councils the right to regulate tohunga proceedings, which, to be quite honest at the time, seen and feared among the Pākehā population. And then the Māori councils regulated such things as cattle branding, dog licensing, suppression of gambling, and they even had a hand in the local governance of schools and Māori health promotion. All good and noble efforts and in the first decade of this Council Act, great progress was made and it was very, very effective in improving housing and sanitation. Maori population rose, attendance of Maori students to school increased, productivity among Maori workers increased. All this was seen as a great accomplishment of raising Maori morale that came through the self-governing Maori councils. But the ongoing funding of the Maori councils through the levy of fines and dog licensing was really quite unsustainable. And in 1929, a great Maori councils conference was convened. And there they wrote to the native minister. They stated that the act did not supply that authority which was necessary to enable the several councils to carry out the full intention of Parliament. The conferences then suggested that the bylaws, which had sort of been phased out, uh, were reinstated. But you know what? A decade passed with nothing much happening. Eventually, in 1940, the Department of Health took over a large portion of what the Maori councils were authorised to do. And by the time that the councils were dissolved in 1945, there wasn't much resistance to that because the vast majority of Maori population saw the act as being of lip service to Maori self-governance. We can certainly say that there was value in terms of laying a foundation for what New Zealand looks like today. I'll catch you tomorrow.